day before your physics test, night before your physics test, morning of your physics test, whatever this is. Let's review. So I made these notes after going through the AP CED uh, for physics. This will work for physics C, which we'll talk about some calculus. If you're not doing calculus, that's fine too. Kinematics, starting there because we start there. Scalar, what that means is direction does not matter. You have two different types of mathematical quantities. We have scalar and we have vector. Vector, remember, has magnitude and direction. Oh yeah, magnitude just means magnitude just means absolute value that's all that means so if you're asked for find the magnitude of blah 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 then you're going to just get the absolute value of that magnitude is a scalar quantity so speed is a magnitude of a velocity vector three kinematic ki equations work if and only if you have a constant acceleration. Those three kinematic equations are Vf equals V0 plus At, velocity as a function of time. Then we have the no time equation, Vf squared equals V0 squared plus 2A delta x. And then finally we have the displacement equation, which is x0 plus V0 t plus 1 half At squared. Don't let that scare you. Remember, some of that is going to get canceled out with zeros, probably. We have our three position velocity acceleration graphs. If you are given one, first thing you need to do whenever you're given any graph is look at the axes. That's the first step. You can't understand what you're doing until you look at the axes. So let's say we're presented with a position versus time graph that looks like this. Because it's concave up, that means it has a positive acceleration. If it was concave down, it would have a negative acceleration. If it was just a straight line, then there would be zero acceleration. All right, so we're going to stick with the blue line there. So for this, our slope starts at zero, and then it steadily increases and gets bigger. Slope starts at zero and steadily increases and gets bigger. Each one of these slope uh, tangent lines that I drew is the velocity at that same exact time. So because the velocity is steadily increasing, we have a positive acceleration. To go from position to velocity or velocity to acceleration, you're going to take the slope. In calculus, that is also called the derivative. To do a derivative, quick uh, dv dt to get acceleration. To do the derivative, you are going to step one, rewrite the equation or the function so that way there are exponents involved. Only exponents, no fractions. Uh, of course the quotient rule can come into play but chances are you're not going to see that or you're not there yet in your calculus class. Uh, so once you rewrite the function, then you're going to sub uh, multiply your coefficient by the exponent. I know the sloppy writing. I know, just listen. Multiply the coefficient by the exponent, and then finally three, we're going to subtract one from the exponent. And then the last step is going to be plug in whatever it is you need, if you need to. Sometimes you need to plug in, sometimes you don't. If you need to find a an acceleration at uh, two seconds, then you would plug in two seconds into your differentiated function. That is the function you got after you took the derivative. This equation over here, this is a differential equation. That d is telling you that's a differential equation. It is a small change in your velocity as your time is also small. And when I mean small, I mean small. Infinitesimally small, to be exact. All right, so to go position to velocity to acceleration, you're taking the slope or the derivative. To go backwards, you're taking the antiderivative or the integral, also known as the area under the curve. So to take the area under the curve, cut it into shapes you know. 
If it's a triangle, it's a triangle. If you have a situation like this, then this to me looks like a square, a rectangle down here, rec a square triangle, triangle and a square. So just cut it into pieces you know. You know the area for a triangle is one-half base times height. You know the area for a square is length times width. What you don't know is the area ah, for this. Well, I did it again. Good for me. Hold on. You don't know the area for this shape, right? And we can't cut that down, so what we are going to do is we are going to integrate. Integrate, or take the integral of when you take the integral, we'll go through our steps. Step one, we are going to add one to the exponent. Step two, we are going to divide by the new exponent. Step three, we are going to set our limits. Step four, we are going to use those limits, and we are going to uh, have the final minus the initial. Let's say we're given the function of position, uh, velocity. Velocity equals 3t squared. So if I'm going to integrate this to get my position, because position is the integral of v dt, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add 1 to the exponent, so that becomes t to the third power, or t cubed, divided by that new um, exponent. Sorry, technical difficulties. Divided by the new exponent. So 3t cubed divided by 3, that goes away, and what we're left with is t cubed. Well, if we're looking for the change in position from 2 to 3 seconds, then we're going to plug in the final, so it's going to be 3 cubed, which will be 27, minus 2 cubed, which is 8, to give us 19 as our displacement for that one second. That's how it works. Vectors are a mathematical quantity that uh, is an arrow, and the length of that arrow is directly proportional to the magnitude of that vector. So the longer the arrow, the greater the magnitude. If this is a force vector, then we would have this. If we wanted to add two vectors together, this goes up to the right two, uh, or up two and to the right two and a half. This goes down two. When I do that, I'm going to do the tip to tail method, where it's going to be the tail of the second vector to the tip of the first vector. And when you draw them proportional to each other, you're going to get the right answer. There's your resultant vector in blue. So that's tip to tail. If you were subtracting, if this is now a subtraction problem, then that just means, uh, we'll do the same. That means you're going to add a negative or add the opposite. So if it first vector is like this, the opposite of this is going to be directly up. Now our resultant is from our ending spot to our beginning spot. There's our resultant vector. Adding vectors graphically. To add them mathematically, keep your x and your y's completely separate. If you have any vector that's at an angle, you have to resolve it into its components. Not on a free body diagram, of course, because we never put components on a free body diagram, but whoop. All right, so to get your x and y components, you are going to remember this little memory aid, cosine on the x, sine on the y. If we're looking for our horizontal component, then I'm going to call this green vector f. Then it's going to be the magnitude of the vector times cosine of the angle, magnitude of the vector on the y times sine of the angle. And then you would actually calculate that out. If you have two vectors, and let's say f1 and f2 would be f2 cosine theta. And that'll give you um, the x component for f2. And you would add these two to get your f total. Right? Because we're adding vectors. Same thing over here. 2 sine theta. You get, you get it. 
no need to continue. Whenever we have a vector at an angle, we have to resolve that vector into its component pieces. So make sure you are doing that. If you have a force at an angle, that means it needs to be split up because X and Y has to be treated separately, which brings us to projectile motion. In projectile motion, the most important thing that you need to remember is that X and Y need to be treated separately. So in projectile motion, we actually have the kinematic equations. We have our velocity as a function of time for x, and we also have it for y. Of course, you don't need to do it like this. You can just keep it like this and just remember that your acceleration is negative 9.8, and that would work just fine. We have our no time equation, v naught squared, plus 2a delta x, and then no time equation on the y, vf y squared, v naught y squared, minus 2g delta y, and then we have the displacement, x equals x naught plus v naught y, oop, v naught t plus one half a t squared. And then displacement in the y, y naught plus v naught y t plus one half a t squared. Enough. All right, so as you can see, x and y behave entirely separately, but something that will combine uh, or join them, the time. The time it takes to fall straight down will be the time that it takes for an object to uh, be, project, be a projectile in the air uh, or have some sort of horizontal displacement. Remember the experiment of the bullet fired and the bullet dropped? They hit the ground at the exact same time. So X and Y are joined by time. So normally what you're going to be doing is you're going to be using your Y equations and solving for time, probably not the y, the no time equation, right? Uh, so you're going to use either one of these two equations to find time, and then you're going to take that time and you're going to plug it back into uh, one of your x equations to find your horizontal displacement or your um, initial horizontal velocity. Anything could be really found. Okay. Speaking of which, if you have a projectile that is launched at an angle, Velocity is a vector. Now we have a vector at an angle, so we would take our initial velocity, cosine theta, to get our horizontal component. Initial velocity, sine theta, to get our vertical component. There are three different types of projectile motion problems you need to be on the lookout for. First one is going to be a horizontally launched projectile. With this, remember your launch angle will equal zero. So when you do v naught sine theta, if theta equals zero, then there is zero velocity because sine of zero is zero. So there's zero velocity in the y. All of your velocity is in the x. If there's no air resistance, then x is going to remain the same all the way throughout. Y In the y direction, there is absolutely acceleration because you have g. The time that it takes to fall will be the same for x and y, so you'll do what we talked about a second ago. Uh, type 2, so we've done all that. Type 2, launched at an angle and caught at the same height. So it looks something like that, but a little bit more symmetrical. It is a parabola, which is symmetrical, which means whatever's happening on one side will happen on the other side as well. So we use that to our advantage, and we normally will set our final velocity equal to zero at the top and we'll solve for time using one of these y equations again. And then remember that when you solve for time at the top, that is not your total time in the air, that's only time to your maximum height. So the time it takes to get to your maximum height is going to be the same time as it takes to go down, so you need to double whatever time you find if you stop the object at the top. Type 3 is uh, perhaps a little bit more rare because it takes time and this is a time test and that's where you launch a projectile at an angle and it lands lower than where it started. The reason why this takes such a long time is to find the time that the object is in the air you would need to use uh, this equation to and set it up equal to zero because that makes it a standard form equation where you have your a term, your b term, your c term uh, with your x's then you can use your quadratic formula to find time. You'll get a positive and you'll get a negative, 
obviously there's no negative time, so you'll take the positive time. Uh, you can also, if you need to find your maximum height, you can just treat it like the first half of a parabola, and then remember to add whatever your initial height was to this height. Small detail, but the details are going to make or break you. Uh, terminal velocity happens. Well, first of all, any object is in free fall if it is under the influence of only gravity. So if gravity is the only force acting on an object, it is in free fall. Yes, this includes things in, in space, like the moon. Uh, if you throw an object up, it is still in free fall even though the term free fall implies that it's coming down. Free fall just means gravity is the only force acting. So, if there is another force, air resistance, that is increasing as you are falling faster and faster and faster, uh, we'll call that F drag, so you're, um, the drag force is steadily increasing as you go faster and faster and faster, until these two vectors are in equilibrium. Once they're in equilibrium, you've reached your maximum speed, and that means you are in terminal velocity. Outstanding. Sorry, I think I, mu I must be pressing the wrong button. And I was. Okay, so for things in terminal velocity, if we were to plot the velocity versus time graph, it's going to look like this where there's a sharp, steady increase in velocity, and then eventually you reach a maximum velocity. Range, as far as projectiles are concerned, is your displacement in your x, while maximum height and altitude are your displacement in your y. Just a couple of vocabulary terms for you. Moving on, Newton's first law is the law of inertia. Uh, you learned it as object at rest stays at rest, blah, 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 but we learned it a, in a better, more accurate way, and that is an object in equilibrium has a zero net force acting on it. So if there's no net force acting on it, then you are not accelerating. You're moving at a constant speed, and that constant speed can be zero. Equilibrium is when B is constant. Uh, think about that free body diagram we just looked at, where you had terminal velocity. We were in equilibrium even though we're falling to the earth, because we've reached terminal velocity. For free body diagrams, you're going to start with a, a dot, and you're going to draw your arrows, and you're going to label them. The arrows, remember, have to be proportional in length. Their length has to be proportional to their magnitude. So the bigger the magnitude, the bigger the arrow. If you do not label it, you will absolutely lose points. Uh, should you get a free body diagram as part of your FRQ? which is pretty likely, I think. Of course, not guaranteed. Make sure you have all of the forces accounted for and you do not have any extra forces. So if you just put in this friction thing and the problem clearly says you're on a smooth surface, sorry, you're gonna miss out on uh, free points there. So just be careful. Make sure you're only drawing the forces that are acting. And if you have an object added at an angle, then be sure to draw that angle in there. If Let's say this is the normal force. So we're on a ramp, weight will always go down towards the center of the Earth. Newton's second law can then come from your free body diagram. And we'll stick with the thing on the ramp. We'll call this Fn and Mg. Okay, so Newton's second law tells us the stuff, the net force, equals the stuff that makes it go minus the stuff that holds it back equals mass times your net acceleration. For an object that is moving in the x and y direction at the same time, like an object on a ramp, then you have to resolve the components of your weight vector. And the way that we do that, the way that we draw this triangle, sometimes it still trips up a few of you. We're going to continue our normal force down, 
and then we're going to, until this length equals our normal force length, and then we're going to connect it to our weight. So we've now made this right triangle, this perpendicular triangle, where we have a perpendicular set of forces, and we have a parallel set of forces, perpendicular and parallel to the ramp. So now this angle right here is the same angle as that ramp was. Those two angles are the same. The normal force then is the adjacent side. So the piece of gravity that's balancing out your normal force is adjacent. And adjacent, we're going to use cosine. So it's mg cosine theta. And the opposite side, opposite, and this is hypotenuse. So we'll use sine mg sine theta. So remember, what is the stuff that makes an object go down a ramp? It's not gravity. It is just the parallel component of gravity. So for this, we would have to do two different equations because we have parallel and we have perpendicular. So for the perpendicular one, you don't have to do it because these two balance out. The object is not sinking into the ramp. It's not floating above. So that means we don't have to do it. But by doing it, it's going to help you if you need to solve for your frictional force, for example. So the stuff that makes it go is just your positive direction stuff, uh, in this case force, minus mg cosine theta, which is in the opposite direction. And we said it's not accelerating up or down in this direction, so that equals zero. So from this we can tell that the normal force equals mg cosine theta when I add mg cosine theta to both sides. So that is useful for the parallel components, the stuff that makes it go, if we imagine this sliding down the ramp, we would say mg sine theta makes it go, and holding it back is going to be our frictional force, right? This frictional force. Please just have memorized your frictional force equation. Mu times Fn. That's it. Mu times Fn. So we can write in mu times Fn here, but it's kind of a wasted step because we already know what Fn equals. Fn equals mg cosine theta, so it's mu, the coefficient of friction, which is a ratio between uh, of the two surfaces in contact with each other. Uh, you can't have a coefficient of friction if you have only one object. Times our normal force, and we said our normal force is mg cosine theta. If this object is sliding down the ramp, then it's equal to mass times acceleration. If it's not sliding down the ramp, then this is zero. And then we can add mu mg cosine theta to each side, and we can solve for mu. When we do that, we will get, for an object that is not accelerating down a ramp, whether it's a skier on a hill, a box on a ramp, anything, if it is not moving down a ramp or moving with a constant speed, then the coefficient of friction will just always equal tan theta. Hopefully you'll get that on a multiple choice and save you some math. Uh, that was a lot. So pause this, rewind it, watch it over and over as much as you need to. Mass attached to a string is tension. If you see mass attached to a string, use forces. That is a type of force. Tension is a force. If you see springs, use forces. Or maybe spring potential energy. We'll get there. Uh, and also remember that F equals F. Any force can equal any other force. If, for example, our frictional force is what's keeping us moving in a circle, then our frictional force, like the penny on the record, the frictional force equals our centripetal force, and we just said our frictional force is mu Fn equals uh, mv squared over r, because that's our centripetal acceleration. So using this, we can figure out a speed. We can use figure out a coefficient of friction. Anything. F equals F. If gravitational potential, or gravitational... Uh, force is what's keeping you moving around um, or orbiting, excuse me, then we would set that equal to. And it would be big G M M over R squared equals M V squared over R. Just remember F equals F. Forces are vectors, so direction matters. If you are in an elevator and you're on the way up, Think about the free body diagram on the way up. You have the acceleration of the elevator going up, and you also have the normal force going up. So you have two forces going upwards, 
which means you are going to feel heavy. Of course, that is because you have inertia, and inertia is the resistance to change motion. Rotational inertia is the resistance to change rotational motion. Uh, on the way down, you are going to feel lighter because in that case you'll have acceleration pulling you down additionally uh, at, on top of gravity. An ideal pulley, that is a special phrase that has a special meaning. That means there is no mass and no friction. So the pulley is only there to change the direction of the string. If it is a massive pulley um, or there is friction, then there's torque that's involved and you would need to use your torque uh, toolbox to do that. More on torque later. Friction always resists. No. No. We know better. Friction always resists sliding. In fact, our motion often relies on us having friction. That's what traction is. So when we walk forward, that is the earth pushing us forward through friction. Our shoes come in contact or our feet come in contact with the earth and we push down and backwards on the earth. The earth is pushing up and forwards on us to move us forward. So friction always resists sliding. Use that to your advantage. If you need to figure out what direction is friction going, ask yourself what direction would this go if there was no friction? Speaking of friction, we have our coefficient of friction, which is, again, the ratio of the um, two surfaces in contact with each other, how much they uh, will dissipate energy. Kinetic friction is the only friction that can dissipate energy. Static friction does not dissipate energy. Static friction is when you're not moving or you're rolling. You have a wheel, in which case you have these points of friction that are coming in contact and they're not slipping. If you are rolling without slipping, it is static friction. If you are rolling and slipping or skidding, then you would use your kinetic friction. Either way, the equations are very similar. Only, the only difference is the less than or equal to sign for your frictional force uh, for static objects. And the actual equation is the absolute value of that. So the magnitude of your frictional force is less than or equal to your coefficient of friction times the magnitude of your normal force. Direction not mattering there. Magnitude just means absolute value. Uh, for kinetic friction, it's an equal sign. Your frictional force equals mu k times fn. Uh, when we pulled the shoe across the desk with the scale. So this is a maximum friction. If you're needing to find the maximum, then we're talking about static friction. You have to overcome static friction before you're dealing with kinetic friction. Once you break those bonds in the uh, temporary bonds and the molecules in contact, then it starts to behave a little bit differently. To solve for mu, start with your free body diagram, then use the net force equals the stuff that makes it go minus the stuff holding it back equals mass times acceleration, and use that frictional force equation we just talked about. Whenever you see the word rough, that means there is friction. Types of force problems uh, could be mass on a string, pulley, elevator, friction, ramps, springs, all of those. Speaking of spring force, Hooke's law tells us that F equals negative Kx, where K is the spring constant or the springiness of a spring. A higher spring constant means it's harder to compress or harder to expand. X is our displacement from equilibrium. Force um, is the spring force. That negative sign just tells us the force is acting in the opposite direction of your displacement. So if you condense a spring, then the force is pushing it out, trying to expand it back to its equilibrium point. Equilibrium point is where there is no net force acting on it. Ramps. Uh, we just talked about ramps. Uh, stuff that makes it go is mg sine theta. Normal force equals mg cosine theta, so that means Frictional force is mu mg cosine theta. Sine over cosine equals tan. Uh, skier on a hill, block on a ramp are the same problem. Uh, be able to identify things on a ramp, uh, whatever form they will show up in. And that's really a lot of what this test is, is you've already solved every type of problem. You just have to recognize 
they've changed the situation. But you're going to use the same methods that you've used all year. Don't be tripped up by that. It's all the same stuff. Newton's law has continued. The maximum angle of the incline the block will not slip means use static friction. So the stuff that makes it go minus the stuff holding it back equals zero. You're going to get... Uh, and then in that case, you're going, going to be solving for theta. Uh, drag force or resistive force, you're going to use either F equals KV or F equals BV squared. BV squared is for larger objects, so this would be like a person falling out of an airplane, while this would be um, air resistance on a ball through the air. Uh, big, fast objects, smaller objects. But remember that F equals F, so negative KV equals MA or negative KV equals MG. A popular, let's get some calculus in here, a popular way to um, turn this into a differential equation, which differential equation just means have some sort of derivative involved, is to say, okay, there's uh, something making it go, let's say F minus KV equals MA, or what should be A. But we know that A is just the derivative of velocity with respect to time. So by substituting that little piece of calculus in there, you now have a differential equation. You now picked up some free points. Congratulations, because you're going to come across a question that says, write but do not solve a differential equation. I don't know that, but history says it's a high probability. So when your drag force equals your weight force, this is terminal velocity. Uh, there's your terminal velocity differ differential equation. V equals distance over time. So if we're moving in a circle, then the distance you travel around a circle is the circumference of the circle, 2 pi r, divided by capital T. T is, capital T is the period, which is the time that it takes or the time that it would take for an object to make one complete cycle around a circle. When moving in a circle, the net force is called your centripetal force. You may have multiple forces acting on you, one going in, one going out. You're going to add your in minus your out, and that's going to be your centripetal force, or the stuff that makes it go into the center of the circle minus the stuff taking it out of the center of the circle. <clears throat> Centripetal force will never go on a free body diagram. It's just a descriptive name. It can be one force or multiple forces added together. So, for example, if we take the penny on the record, we have mg going down, we have fn going up, and then keeping us on the record was our frictional force. So, our frictional force. In this case, is what's keeping us moving towards the center of the circle. To have circular motion, you need to have two things. You need to have a centripetal acceleration directed inwards, because centripetal means center-seeking. And you also need to have a tangential velocity, tangent to the path. These two have to be at 90 degrees to each other. And when you add these two up, you get a resultant in this direction. And then you would have centripetal force, and you'd have a tangential velocity, and now you have a resultant in this direction. Do this an infinite number of times, and you have a circle. Speaking of which, I just said something that might have thrown you off. Remember, A equals our net force over M. That means that A and F are directly proportional to each other. A and M are inversely proportional to each other. If I were to have a graph of acceleration versus time, I could pull a quantity from here. Uh, let's say right here my acceleration versus time was 7. My force is going to be proportional to that. So if my acceleration versus time was something weird where it was like this, my force is increasing and then decreasing and then increasing and then, and then decreasing because my acceleration is decreasing and then increasing. So those two mean the same thing. So whenever you read acceleration, it's okay if you think uh, force. It, and whenever you read force, it's okay to think acceleration. If you were to uh, draw or be given 
an f over m graph, f over m. We're dividing the axes, so that means the slope of this line is going to give us our acceleration at any given time. If we took something and we were multiplying the two axes, like v, uh, x equals vt, so let's say we had a velocity versus time graph, if we're multiplying those two, then that means we're looking at the area under the curve. Want to make sure we cover everything here. Okay, so you can have more, multiple forces acting uh, for a centripetal force. Uh, for example, a roller coaster at the top of a loop, you have the weight force going down and you have the normal force going down. Now, of course, you don't have the weight force and the normal force as your centripetal force because if there's a normal force, that has to be counteracted by another normal force in the opposite direction uh, because the cart is in contact. But if the cart is no longer in contact, then there is no, no normal force. If it's barely in contact, uh, then we can look at it as and say normal force plus our weight force equals... Moving on, if you are slowing down or speeding up while traveling in a circle, you have tangential acceleration. So the two types of t acceleration, if you have velocity acting in the same direction as your acceleration, then you're speeding up. This is tangential acceleration. It's moving in the same direction as your velocity. If you, and this type of acceleration changes your speed, if you're going in a circle, then you have centripetal acceleration and a tangential velocity. This type of acceleration changes your direction. If you change your speed or your direction, because velocity is a vector, then you have acceleration. So if your speed is changing, you have acceleration. If your direction is changing, you have acceleration, even if you're moving with a constant speed around a circle. If you are, then you're in uniform circular motion. Uh, what else? What else? Uh, centripetal force will never go on a free body diagram. It's just a descriptive name. It can be one or multiple forces added together. Uh, to move in a circle, you have to have tangential velocity and a radial acceleration, the centripetal acceleration. Remember that F equals F, so your centripetal force could be any uh, combination of forces. You can always substitute any force equal to each other. If Fg, big G equals Fn, great. Or maybe Fg equals Ff. Somehow, some way. The point is, they're both forces, so they're interchangeable. The same way as if you uh, have your time in your y equations, uh, 1 half gt squared, and you've solved for time, that time is the same as the time in x equals v naught times t. So you can use that time over here because they're the same thing, same principle. Whenever you have two things that are equal to each other, you can just change them out or set them equal to each other. Slope of a force versus mass graph, we've already talked about that. That's going to give you acceleration. Uh, the area under the curve of a force versus mass graph is nothing, nothing useful. On to Newton's third law. Newton's third law says if object A exerts a force on object B, then object B must exert a force on object A in equal magnitude and opposite direction. So that means that you have to have two objects for Newton's third law to be in effect. You cannot take a box on the ground and say, oh, well, there's a down gravity and there's an up normal force. That normal force is not the reactionary force uh, for a force pair. This is not a force pair. In order for that, you need to have two completely different objects. If you name the box and the table that it's on, then we would have a free body diagram for the box and the table, and it would look like this. And then you would have a free body diagram for the table and the block, in which the normal force is in the same direction as your weight force, uh, so the normal force is in the same direction as the weight force for the table, well then you would have to ask yourself, well, why isn't this thing going down? There must be some sort of uh, force holding it up. 
to balance these two out. Remember that a, a force pair has to be the same type of force. So if you have normal force going up, then you need to have normal force going down. They have to be the same force for it to be a force pair. Uh, there must be two objects. Normal force is not a result in Newton's law. Uh, Atwood's machine. Atwood's machine is the mass and the pulley. Or you could have a modified Atwood's machine where it's looking like this, and you got a pulley up here, and then you got a block over here, and a block hanging off. You can treat these as a system, and you can do the stuff that makes it go minus the stuff that holds it back. For example, if this is M1 and this is M2, and M2 is bigger than M1, then the stuff that makes it go will be the weight of M2 minus the weight of M1 equals mass 1 plus mass 2, the mass of the entire system, times your acceleration. And then you could solve this for acceleration, and it's going to be M2g minus M1g divided by M1 plus M2 for your acceleration, and then take that entire acceleration and plug it into the tension equation. Uh, the tension, uh, tension making it go, that would be M1 minus Fg1 equals m times a, m1a. And you would take that whole a equation that you just uh, figured out, which was m2g minus m1g all over m1 plus m2, and you plug that in there, and then you could solve for tension by adding your weight to that side. You may want to go back and review what I just said there, because that was a lot, and it was quick, and it's important because you're going to see an Atwoods machine. You're going to see um, a modified Atwoods machine, in which case you can handle the this just like a system as well. The only difference is now we're at an angle, and whenever you're at an angle, that tension is going to be um, parallel to the ramp, which means we need to resolve our weight component into components, and we'll have mg sine theta for the parallel to the ramp and mg cosine theta for the perpendicular. If there's friction, then that's also parallel to the ramp. All of that that we've already talked about. Work and energy. Work is the integral of force with respect to R. This is for this equation when force is not constant. So if you have a changing force, for example, a force versus displacement graph that would look like this, where your force is changing. Uh, so if your force is changing and you need to find the work done, well, we know that work equals FD, so we would take the area under the curve. Or, if your force is changing like this with curves, then you're going to integrate. Remember, re uh, look at the first part of the review video to see how to do that, FDR. Um, also, work equals force times displacement. Remember that these two uh, vectors have to be parallel to each other. To get that, we can add in cosine theta. So if we're looking for uh, work done by gravity, gravity going down, our displacement is only up. So this would be negative work being done. Uh, work also equals the change in energy. 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 Please, why can't you just remember that? Work equals the change in energy. This could be work equals the change in kinetic energy, or it could be work equals the change in gravitational potential energy. Work is transforming energy from one form to another. It could be adding it into a system. We could be adding energy in if we're applying an external force to a system, or it could be removing energy from a system, in which case work would be negative. Friction acts in the opposite direction of your displacement, so then friction is a non-conservative force. It is removing energy from the system, negative energy. How do you deal with energy in relation to uh, work? Well, remember, conservation of energy. Total mechanical energy in the beginning has to equal total mechanical energy in the end. Total mechanical energy is just adding up all of your energies. So if you have US plus UG plus U big G plus K, 
translational plus K rotational in the beginning, and in the end you have only gravitational uh, potential energy near the surface of the Earth, then okay, that's fine. Uh, as long as the system is not being affected by um, any external forces. But let's say there is a force that's removing energy. Well, then we're just going to subtract the work done and still set it equal to. So we're just adding in this work term as one of these energy terms. Let me do it a little bit uh, simpler for you. So let's do the classic. We start with gravitational potential energy because we have some height, and then we end up with kinetic energy in the end. Well, as we're going down, we lose some energy due to friction. So the work done by a non-conservative force equals our final kinetic energy. If I wanted to figure out, uh, I don't know, we could do, we could figure out force, figure out whatever. We can subtract gravitational potential energy from each side. All I'm doing is treating this work like one of these energy terms. That's it. You just have to remember that um, work equals force times displacement. It also equals your change in energy. So there's your energy change, and it also equals your work. Work equals the change in energy. Why? Why can't you just remember that? If it's frictional force, then you're frictional force. So it would be mu mg. If you're on a ramp, then it's mu mg cosine uh, times the distance that you went down the ramp equals kf minus ugi. It's easy stuff. Get that. Three points. All right, enough yelling at you. Let's get back to the review. Uh, work is the bridge between energy and force. So just like what I did here, we treated work as an energy term, and then we substituted in force times displacement. Work is that bridge between the two different types of problem-solving strategies. The angle between force and displacement has to be or should be zero. We want them to be parallel, and that's why we use the cosine theta. Uh, if the angle between the two is zero, cosine of zero is one, so you have the maximum amount of work being done between the two objects. Work equals F D cosine theta. We were just doing a problem where the question was, what was the work being done? And it gives you F D cosine theta, F D sine theta, FD tan theta, and then some random thing where, may, I don't know, maybe tan theta. Obviously, it's going to be this one. You don't have to know what the question was, what the situation was. This is just the equation. So just by knowing the equation, when to use cosine, when to use sine, can get you some points. Uh, so uh, power is the rate that work is done. So power is the rate that energy is transformed within the system. Power equals work over time. Well, I'm going to write it because I love doing this derivation so much. Power is your change in energy over uh, time. Change in energy, well, let me write the right thing, man. Power equals your change in energy over time. Change in energy is work. Work also equals force times distance over time. And what is distance over time? Force times velocity. All of these are measured in the unit watts, or capital W, as the unit. Not to be confused with work, where we use capital W for a symbol. Work is scalar, but can be positive, negative, or zero, depending on that angle between the force and the displacement. If it's an acute angle, then you have positive work being done. If it's an obtuse angle, then you have negative work being done and energy is being transformed out of the system. Uh, conservative forces have an associated potential energy. For example, spring force, gravitational potential energy. So those are your conservative forces. Non-conservative forces, again, are removing energy. Kinetic friction dissipates energy. Energy is also dissipated in perfectly inelastic collisions. More on that later. Conservative force would be the slope of a gravitational potential energy or spring potential energy versus displacement. So I know that because you, my 
change in u over my change in x. Now that's work over displacement, which is force, because work and change in energy are the same thing, right? might not be that apparent to you. That's kind of a trickier one. So it may be useful to remember that the slope of a potential energy versus displacement graph is force. If you're ever confused, do what I just did. We're looking for delta u, delta x. What is the relationship there? Delta u, change in any kind of energy? You already know change in any kind of energy is work. Delta x, okay, what's work? versus time, force. That's what I did. All right, conservative force is uh, spring force for an ideal spring. We already talked about Hooke's law, negative kx, because, negative because the opposite direction. Work equals the integral of your force with the changing force. Uh, work also can equal then negative kx because f equals f, in which case x would be uh, changing. By taking that integral, we get the spring potential energy, which is 1 half kx squared. Don't forget that squared. Don't forget that squared. On to more springs. We have springs in series and springs in parallel. Uh, if we look for the total displacement here, the total displacement, if I took this mass starting from the blue and I stretch it all the way to the red, then my displacement would be x1 plus x2, right? Stretched it. These are two different springs that are connected to each other. So then my total displacement would equal x1 plus x2. Well, we have a spring constant. So we have a spring force, f equals kx. If we solve this for x, x equals f over k. The force is always going to be the same, but the spring constant will not. So because that force is always the same, we can divide each of these terms by f, and that'll make them go away. So that means our total k, if we have springs connected like this, connected to each other, our total k is going to be 1 over k plus 1 over k2. 1 over k1 plus 1 over k2, and this one is also 1 over. Another way to write that is the inverse of k1 equals the inverse of k2, and then inverse that answer. Either way you look at it. Uh, if the this picture is drawn wrong. If there's a bar that connects two springs like this, then in this case our displacement is going to be the same for each of those. The displacement is the same, but the force acting is going to be different. So uh, F1 plus F2 will give us F totes. And F1, again F equals Kx, kx plus k2x, k1x, x is the same, equals k totes x. x is the same, so we can divide by each term by x. So for this situation, our total spring potential equals sp the spring potential, or excuse me, spring constant equals spring constant 1 plus spring constant 2. I am so sorry for that. Rewind it. Yell at me. That's fine. All right, so moving on, we have gravitational potential energy near the surface of Earth versus gravitational potential energy, big G, big stuff, out in space. Big G, big objects. Negative, so UG equals negative GM M over R. Negative because as you get closer to infinity, there is zero gravitational potential energy. There's zero chance of it coming back and smashing into the planet that it's orbiting. For little g, we're near the surface of Earth. Uh, if you have height, you have gravitational potential energy. 
and you can move h equals zero to wherever is useful for you to solve problems. T Mass times v squared over r. 